Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Heinz Trout from Red Schools, Northern England. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, I'm just going to ask Helen, who's the host behind the scenes, to confirm in, in the chat if she can hear me okay. And if we're live, which I think we are. Right, so I, I presume everybody can hear me okay um, and, and see me. Okay, I'm just going to start the slides whilst I'm busy loading that. In the right hand side of your screen, you should be able to post any questions in the chat bar. Um, Helen's going to keep an eye on the chat and um, then towards the end post uh, to me any any questions to be answered. Um, so yes, I hope everybody can hear me okay and you can see the red scroll on your screen um, at the start of pres the presentation. So I'm going to just talk through a little bit about red scroll conservation in the north of England and, and try to focus a little bit on Cumbria as well. Uh, and and share a little bit about what we do uh, as a project in in the northwest um, obviously we work in the northeast as well so without further ado a little bit of background very briefly um, we've been involved in red school conservation for many many years in various various shapes and forms uh, going back as early as 1991 um, in and red as a project called red alert and then it was save our squirrels and since 2011, end of end of 2011, as Red Schools Northern England. Um, if I go to the next screen, All right. So let's look a little bit of Red Schools. Just a little bit of background. Um, why is conservation of Red Schools necessary? Uh, if you look at the map on the screen now, uh, which was produced by Red School Survival Trust. Uh, and the map on the left shows the distribution of red schools and gray schools across the nation in 1945. So you can still see we had good distribution of reds back then, but grays already gaining ground. Looking at the map in the middle, the year 2000, you can see the advanced gray school. And then on the right hand side, more recent 2010, a significant increase in the distribution and replacement of red squirrels. The grey obviously being grey and the sort of orangey colour being an overlap and and that red area that you can see around the centre there, that's probably orange as well now. So in the north of England, uh, about 2005, um, various partners including the Forestry Commission got together and decided to designate uh, red squirrel strongholds and there were 17 of those designated across the north of England as being refuges or or reserves of for red squirrels just because those uh, forests tended to be um, uh, uh, conifer forests where grey schools don't really thrive but yet reds can hang on um, so that was back then so let's have a look at red squirrels and and the ecology and then we'll start looking at where are they at these days red squirrels so i think we're all familiar with what they look like they're quite distinct um entertaining species to watch they they're quite different to the gray squirrels they've got ear tufts which grow in the cooler months of the year they do lose them uh, in the summer they molt twice a year autumn and spring and you're probably likely to see a couple of scraggly looking red squirrels this time of the year because of the molting. The, the distinct color, hence the name red squirrel, uh, they're much smaller than the gray squirrel. And uh, where do they live? Well, they live in drays up trees, it tends to be sort of three quarters of the way up the main trunk of the tree. And the nests are made out of various bits that they can find, sticks, branches, moss, feathers, uh, a nice and cozy environment on the inside. What do squirrels eat? Uh, well, quite a variety of different um, seeds, 
uh, cones, fungi, berries, flower buds, and so on. Here is an example of uh, squirrel nibbled cones found in the forest, Scots pine top left. So when you look walk around the forest, keep an eye out for these. A Norway spruce over there, a larch, and on the right hand side, hazelnuts. Do notice that um, hazelnuts when nibbled by mice look slightly different. Here is a, an example of a few cones found by one of our rangers in, in the North Lakes. Uh, Douglas fir top left, Sitka spruce, and then bottom right large, and then Scott pine bottom left. Squirrels do change their behavior <clears throat> as the seasons progress. And the, the bar at the top illustrates their, their activity patterns during the winter. Because we got very short days and it's much cooler, squirrels tend to stay in their trays much longer and they'll come out and there'll be a peak of activity mid-morning and then it'll phase out again early bedtime and then in the spring and autumn that starts to change in summer it's significantly pronounced and there are peaks of activity early in the morning good time to get out to see squirrels at that time of the day and then at day they tend to have a little rest um, and then a little peak of activity late afternoon early evening Baby squirrels are born blind, deaf, and hairless, and it takes them about three weeks to start opening their eyes and to grow fur. By about seven weeks, they're mini adults, and by 10 weeks, it's, it's time to be booted out of the nest and be young adults. What are the threats of red squirrels? Um, a variety of uh, things that do uh, present some challenges. Um, loss of habitat is an obvious one. Bear, uh, Bear in mind that the afforestation in the last century due to conifer plantations to produce timber for the nation has been a significant help in providing habitats. Even though it's conifers, it still provides habitats. And in some places, it's really uh, brought them back after local extinction. Uh, pets are, domestic pets can also be uh, a threat to squirrels and um, we advise people to place, think very carefully about where uh, squirrel feeder boxes are placed, um, out of reach of cats that may want to predate on them. Also to keep dogs uh, under control within forests. And then also roads, uh, another, uh, another issue. Uh, again, there's some advice in, to, in relation to where feeder boxes are placed. Try not to place it so that you're enticing Reds to cross roads rather place it other side of the road so that they um, don't need to. And then the most significant threat really uh, is grey squirrels, um, not only because of the habitat competition, but also because of the disease they carry. And we'll we'll come on to that in a minute. So grey squirrels they are um, are much bigger animals and um, they have a distinct colour. If, if in doubt and it's an overcast day and you just happen to be spotting a squirrel running uh, underneath the forest canopy, keep an eye out for the tail because it tends to have a sort of a halo effect where uh, it's like gray at the base, black in the middle, and then the tips of the hairs on the tail are white and it sort of produces a halo effect. And they have no ear tufts, quite stocky and much bigger. So as mentioned, they outcompete reds for habitat and um, left to their own, dev own devices just through pure numbers and breeding prolifically because they do so well in our native forests, uh, you're consuming large seeded um, broadleaf tree seed like acorns and beech and hazels. They have the ability to really do well and they, they, science has, research has shown that they are have the ability because of certain enzymes in their di digestion system to extract up to 60% more energy out of the food in comparison to reds. So they're in good body condition and therefore they breed prolifically and would outcompete reds very quickly. And they also 
And this is a significant point. They carry the squirrel pox disease to uh, which they themselves are not affected. And, um, but it's least rates, unfortunately. And um, typically red schools, when they contract the disease, uh, they acquire lesions and scabs around any exposed area of skin. And that tends to be obvious around the eyes and the ears and the feet and so on. And because they have developed these swellings and scabs, they become malnourished because they can't forage effectively and they become disorientated and weak and, re and death results within about 15 days. Uh, so it's very quick, it's a very nasty disease. It's difficult to catch it early enough and get a squirrel to a vet. Normally when the symptoms are displayed, then it's a little bit late. Um, but I'm going to just switch over to a quick little video, um, if all goes well, about the pox, if you bear with me. Um, Helen, I'm not sure if it's listed there. No, I don't see that one. That's a shame. Um, let me see if there's oh, a sorry. different way I can potentially share it. Let's see. Just bear with me a few clicks. I'll see if I can find that. Um, no, we haven't got that one, I'm afraid. Sorry. Anyway, it was just a, a little video um, explaining a little bit more about school pox and um, just covering all what we've just discussed now. It's it's a very it's very difficult to to treat once the animal is already exhibiting the symptoms. Uh, it's it's a matter of days before they're affected. If uh, uh, there is a, a suspected pox red squirrel found, it's advisable to even though it might be quite late to still catch it through using a live trap and getting it to a vet. By doing so, you are removing it as a risk from the, the resident population of red squirrels because obviously it can affect and, and transmit the disease to them. And secondly, you might have an opportunity or the vet might not have an opportunity to still administer antibiotics and, and save it. But yes, remove it for the safety of the other reds potentially get some treatment for it. Gray squirrels, yes, uh, interesting picture that I spotted recently. You know, they do have a ecological impact uh, on the biodiversity of our forests. They, they're not a native species they're from America and um, they, they outcompete. They, they are non-native invasive species. Now the term invasive means that they no, self-explanatory, they invade and they take over um, quite drastically so. Not only do they affect our biodiversity by um, um, affecting squirrels, but also our forests. And grey squirrel damage to trees is quite a significant issue uh, in the country. And um, I've got a video and that should work, so I'm going to play that quickly. It runs for about seven minutes, so sit back and Enjoy. <clears throat> Healthy trees are vital for a sustainable future, providing clean air and water, sequestering carbon, supplying timber, supporting wildlife, and enhancing human health and well being. Yet they're under increasing pressure from rapid climate change, from pests and diseases, and from invasive species that are spread around the world, deliberately or accidentally, through global trade and travel and can cause major environmental, economic and societal issues. Originally from North America, grey squirrels were introduced to areas of England and Ireland between 1876 and 1929 for ornamental interest. But their spread across large areas of the British Isles has caused local extinctions of red squirrels, and profoundly damaged tree health through their bark stripping activities. Once the squirrel takes the bark off the tree, what happens is that it interrupts the sap flow. The sap flow is the kind of the blood, the juices that, that, that make, help the tree grow. And so all the energy and photosynthetic capacity that goes into the green leaf matter gets transported down through the phloem and, and that's, that's the stuff that gets damaged, it's what the, what the squirrels are actually after. And it interrupts growth. 
normal growth and interrupts total uh, volume growth, but also the form, and it's the form thing that the foresters get very upset set about. But the total growth is the thing that, that, that matters in terms of uh, carbon sequestration and hence climate change. Grey squirrels are one of the major threats to our woodlands, um, especially the creation of young mixed native woodlands as they are basically destroying them. Grey squirrels often target the healthiest and most vigorous trees, causing major damage and fatalities to ecologically and economically important broadleaf species. You can see down here, there was a little trial site of, of damage that was happened actually last summer. And the squirrel obviously liked this tree, uh, so this summer's returned, and you can see up here, it's taken the, taken the bark from all the way up, and it's now killed the top of the tree. That matters to the economics of, of, of broadleaf woodland management because once that tree is damaged, you, net, you fail to recover the value that you put into it in the first place. And whilst that might not sound insignificant, actually there, there are also other impacts. That tree will never achieve the great height that you, of the trees, mature trees that you see, see today. It'll just be a, a, a poorly misshapen tree. It will actually fail to deliver all the things that we're trying to deliver with, with uh, climate change and on the carbon front it'll be suboptimal, considerably suboptimal uh, on, on the carbon front. And what happens over time is it isn't this, just this tree, this was the first year, slowly but surely it'll be that tree there and that tree there and that tree there and uh, you get an attrition and over a period of seven to eight years you might find that 30, 40, 50, 60, even 80 percent, even 90 percent of the trees are damaged. While bark stripping causes major problems for hardwood timber growers, it also has a negative impact on the biodiversity that large trees can support as they grow and mature. So in terms of um, the biodiversity side of the woodland, what we want is that some of our trees will replace eventually the big veteran trees which have their own ecosystems with the niches for uh, plants and lichens um, with niches for mammals and birds to nest and shelter um, and the canopy shelter that they give to insects. So the problem with um, damage by grey squirrels, they don't just damage the timber potential of your woodland, they're going to stop your tree, your young trees becoming the next biodiverse uh, generation of veteran trees. So there's um, a misconception, I think, that uh, it's, it's a great thing to have um, damaged, tr uh, damaged trees. Uh, one of the things a lot of our woodlands are short of is deadwood. And there's a, a sort of misconception that a damaged tree it provides more deadwood. But actually, a dam the deadwood should be coming from old trees losing limbs or old trees having rot. But um, the squirrels are doing damage to young trees and a damaged 20-year-old tree is not providing, is, it, that's not a part of a healthy ecosystem to have that deadwood coming from a young tree. That tree should be vigorous and healthy and there to replace the high canopy in the future. As science and technology evolves, New solutions to old problems are constantly being explored. In 2017, for example, the UK Squirrel Accord Partnership began research on an oral contraceptive for grey squirrels. Over the coming years, it's hoped this will offer an effective, less labour-intensive and non-lethal option for management. The reason for this research comes mainly from public demand for alternatives to um, lethal methods to manage wildlife. The project supported by the UK Squirrel Accord is something we are particularly keen on because it's a multi-year project that gives us the possibility of both developing and testing new contraceptives, oral contraceptives for wildlife. We've been involved and hope to be involved in some of the trial work on the new contraceptive that is being developed as a means of controlling grey squirrels. I think this is the, the great hope for us all in that this could be an effective way of significantly reducing the grey squirrel population. There's now a growing appreciation of the need to find new innovative solutions and to raise greater awareness of the issues our trees face. To this end, the Yorkshire Arboretum is building a new tree health centre to provide a hub for education and knowledge sharing. 
One of the things we want to do at the Tree Health Centre that we're building here at the Yorkshire Arboretum is to promote the concept of healthy trees in a healthy landscape for a healthy general environment for everyone. And that includes thinking about what trees to plant for the future. Do we plant things like sycamore, which are squirrel prone? Do we think of other things? Do we think of a mixture and so forth to co counteract all this problem with tree pest diseases and squirrels? I think we need a healthy mixture in the woodland. We need sensible squirrel management and vigilance against all sorts of these problems that are affecting our trees. As we lose increasing numbers of broadleaf trees to grey squirrel bark stripping alongside pests and diseases, it's crucial that we focus even more on protecting the health of these important species, working together to ensure a truly sustainable future. Right, um, I'm back and I think my sound is bang back on. Uh, apologies for the echo some people are experiencing. Um, don't think there's anything we can do about it at the moment. Um, right, so clearly grey squirrels do present um, some challenges. Uh, bark stripping being a significant problem nationally and therefore uh, it has provided the impetus for a solution to be found. And we'll briefly touch on the uh, amino contraceptive mentioned in that video clip a little bit later. But yes, I mean, uh, in terms of biodiversity and the health of our forests, to deal and manage grey squirrels is really important because it's not only red squirrels that's affected, it's the general and wider biodiversity of the forest that's affected. No trees, no habitat, end of the day. So what do we as a project, uh, RSNE, do? Uh, well, we're involved in, in various, various uh, areas. Our key aim of the project is to maintain red squirrel range that we currently do have and where possible to extend that. Um, we depend on strong practical science for what we do and why we do it, how we do it. Uh, uh, some of the things we do focus on is squirrel monitoring. So we currently are running a spring monitoring program across the north of England. There are about 150 survey sites in uh, Cumbria and then associated with that is grey squirrel management and to deliver some of that ourselves and but also to help facilitate others to do that whether it be training volunteer groups or engaging landowners and helping them to access government grant schemes to help them do that so we work with local community uh, red school groups uh, i'll show you a map um, soon showing where those uh, areas are or where those groups are within cumbria and then we collaborate with multiple partners uh, to do with red school conservation research, including the Animal and Plant Health Agency that just briefly introduced the, the concept of uh, fertility control for grey squirrels. So grey squirrel population management, uh, what does that mean? Well, it means trapping and, um, and culling grey squirrels. Uh, it is an unfortunate necessity and part of conservation of red squirrels and protecting the habitat um, that we need to do. Does it work? Um, well, I've just picked out a, a really good example from um, a counterpart in North Wales, Dr. Craig Shuttleworth. And this is, I think this example really spells it out very well. Um, it's my, by no means an isolated example, but just one a good example that shows in uh, Anglesey in the year 2002, grey squirrels were numerous on the island and they were trapped and samples were taken to determine um, if they were carrying antibodies for the squirrel pox virus. 75% uh, of that population tested positive um, for the virus. And then the population of greys on Anglesey were then trapped and the population reduced right down to low levels. The, that low population was again sampled and the proportion of the greys that tested positive was only 4%. And um, the, the sampling was replicated on the mainland just to cry the Men across the Menai Straits on the mainland. And there again, because the population of greys there were not managed and still high at high densities that percentage was high 
So therefore, what, what this tells us is that when you thin out population carrying the disease of uh, the gray schools, it reduces the prevalence of the virus and therefore reduces the risk to red schools. And then obviously in Anglesey, the number of red schools bounced back up because they had opportunity to breed and, and thrive again. So yes, it does work. Uh, here is an example from a state um, in the Allen Valley in Dumfrieshire. Just looking at one estate uh, over a period of four years where gray schools were managed. And each year you can see there are about between 90 and 120 grays managed. And in year four, suddenly there was a change noticed that grade schools started to bounce back. There were more of them about. Yes, they still had to continue to control grey schools, but it, by suppressing that population of greys, reds on the estate had opportunity to bounce back. Why do greys continue to needing to be trapped? Well, they weren't managed everywhere around the surrounding landscape, so they still come in onto the estate and needs management. So grey school control network, it's, it's desirable um, essential really to have a, a linked up or a network of gray school management and doing so in isolation just wouldn't make sense uh, you'd be fighting a losing battle but once the network is linked up which it's starting to be uh, you can make a significant difference these are the results from last year um, so what you are looking at for example on the map on the left is, are the results from over 30 local volunteer groups across the north of England, including RSNE. Those are the blue dots, represents RSNE's area of activity, and the yellow dots represent volunteer group activity. So wherever there is a dot, there is somebody doing something to manage gray squirrels in order to protect red squirrels. And then on the right hand side, you see the red squirrel detection for last year. The, the little pie charts at the bottom, looking at the first one on the far left bottom, shows that the area of effort in Cumbria is 68% of the whole of all this data. So significant or twice as much effort in comparison to the Northeast is uh, invested in Cumbria. So a lot of effort going into Cumbria and hence you can see a really good spread and distribution of red squirrels in Cumbria. Yet grey squirrels are still there, uh, we can't say we've done it, we need to maintain that pressure on red squirrels, I mean on grey squirrels in order to protect red squirrels. The pie chart in the middle represents the proportion of area that local groups um, uh, invest effort into 87% and RSNE does 13% of that. The area, we've got two ranges in Cumbria. We've got Matt who operates in the North Lakes. So that's starting at Thilmere around Bassenthwaite and at Greystoke Forest. In the South Lakes as part of a partnership project with the National Trust Forestry England and the local groups, Westmoreland and, and Grasmere. We've got a project where our ranger Jack works uh, in collaboration with those partners. The project there is called Grasmere to Grisdale, um, being, being the areas in the forests. In the northeast, just for interest, um, the, the uh, contribution RSE delivers is 27% and 73% of the effort is local groups. There are a lot more um, bigger groups in Cumbria, um, so hence more investment in, in uh, effort. Just looking at the northeast for your interest, just zooming in on those areas of activity. I'm going to skip to the next slide for Cumbria. Um, so yeah, yeah, this just zooms in. The map on the on the left shows the detail again we saw on the summary um, sheet. So a tremendous amount of effort being invested by local groups. And on the right hand side, that's just the represented representation of the same data, but showing the number of gray schools managed. And um, the number of managed is 
very very high at, at thousands of um, graves that have been removed across the landscape if that had not been done we would be in a totally different um, position uh, so th thank you to the local volunteer groups who, who represent about over 80 percent of the graves that are removed from the landscape to help our rents and then the, these are just zoomed in uh, slides of red school distribution overlapped over the local red school group area. And um, I think Helen is going to provide a, a link to uh, the website for Nor Northern Red Schools where you can go and have a look where your local group is to, to link up with if you want to participate in helping. Um, there's so many ways you can help, not just managing grade schools, but monitoring administration, fundraising, etc. Uh, there, there it is. Uh, so yes, this is uh, Northern Red Schools, 32 groups across the north of England. Um, you've got the Penrith and District Red School, School Group over there. You've got Brampton, Solway Group. Below that, you've got the Allerdale Group, uh, and then the Benzie Group, just above that. Uh, Ennerdale, Copeland Group and the West Lake School Initiative. You've got the South Lakes Group. You've got the Westmoreland Red School Group, Sedberg, and Garsdale, and Malastang. So those are all the groups in Cumbria. So th this talk is really for Cumbria, so hence my focus on a bit more on Cumbria groups. Um, I mentioned briefly earlier on that we help landowners to access grants. Um, if you're a landowner or know of a landowner who might be interested, there's a government grant uh, under countryside stewardship called the Woodland Improvement Grant. It pays £100 a hectare for woodland improvement. It has up to 17 different environmental objectives, not that the landowner needs to sign up to all of them, the ones that are relevant but grey schools and red schools are in there as well. Um, we can help landowners to make sense of the application process and the, the terms of the grant uh, and help to uh, draw up a strategy and approach for um, woodland improvement, if you like. So um, do spread the word if, if there are any landowners that we can help uh, access and it, it's, it's a benefit to the landowner because it pays them to deliver environmental improvement, woodland improvement. And obviously the advantage to us is that it gives them the incentive to also manage grey schools. And we'd be happy to help give advice <clears throat> how to access and manage these grants. The monitoring program is um, something that we um, are involved in every spring we we coordinate the spring monitoring program and i think i've got a video on this one coming up soon just the methodology if you like so the monitoring program 300 sites across the north of england the main method that we use is uh, a feeder box <clears throat> and a camera uh, opposite each other uh, that is deployed into the woodlands for four weeks in the spring between any time between March and May. And we're always looking for volunteers to help with this activity. So if you're interested, we're already um, al almost finished with this year's program, but next year do get in touch. And um, we always need help with those. You might be wondering what the, this is the bottom left. It's a sticky adhesive pad Velcro that we attach to the a feeder lid that shows some samples of hair from the head of squirrels. That's red squirrel and those are gray squirrel heads. And next slide, yeah, there's just a illustration of where the sticky tabs go and what a feeder box looks like. And I wonder if anybody can spot a squirrel on this page. I'll let you have a quick think. I'll have to tell you, I think. There it is. So yeah, keep a close eye on your on your SD card images from your from your cameras. 
Um, yeah, as mentioned, we the, the hair samples is really just a backup method. Um, the camera cameras these days are quite reliable and efficient, but just in case they malfunction during the monitoring program, we also use these sticky tabs to collect hair samples. We analyze them under microscopes, um, either optical or USB microscopes, and there is a way to, to distinguish between red and gray squirrel hairs. Um, you've got to drain your eye in a little bit for it, but yet yeah, it's, it's not that difficult. Here is an illustration of a red squirrel hair cross section. It's got a pronounced indentation along the length of the hair, whereas gray squirrel hairs tend to be more uh, oval in shape. Um, obviously, bottom left um, slide A shows red squirrel hairs. Uh, you can just about see the groove and also the color is uniform, whereas you look on the right hand side, gray squirrel hair is multicolored quite pronounced black and uh, brownie color. The spring monitoring program, the last time we did it was 2019, 2020 wasn't possible as we all can appreciate. But yeah, over 170 people involved with the monitoring program, 86% uh, of those are volunteers. And uh, without their help, it just wouldn't be possible. Uh, and it's across six, uh, seven counties, um, you know, including Lancashire, um, Durham and so on. 190 surveys we did in two, 2019. Over three months, the proportion of greys as far as occupancy detection of the 290 tetrads surveyed was 45.9% and 43.4%. The slides coming up or graphs coming up that will show that trend over time and make sense of it a bit more. Next slide, there it is. So looking at the survey results between 2012 and 2019, you can see the black bar is gray school occupancy in those survey sites. Um, and so basically you survey a site and you get a result. The result can either be nothing, red only, gray only, or both. So wherever you have a gray detected, it's counted as one sample from one of those 100, 290. So that's what this proportion represents, the occupancy from those 290 sites surveyed. Uh, we call them tetrads because they're two by two kilometer survey areas. Uh, anyway, red squirrel, the red line obviously, and you can see that there's a, a stability, a measure of stability over a five year period. There will be natural fluctuations due to uh, environmental factors food, weather, and so on. But to see this level occupancy percentage of red squirrels is significant because if you think back to the second or third slide we looked at where you saw the decline of red squirrel range across the north of England, but you see this, it's telling us a story. And that story is that red squirrels are hanging on in the north of England. Why? Well, it's because of the effort in the main by local red school groups, which is fantastic. The monitoring mon monitoring program. So I'm going to try and share a quick video just of me um, demonstrating how a survey is done, just to give you an idea of what it entails. <clears throat> Let me just find. It's about nine minutes, so sit back and enjoy. <laughs> So when you're heading out into the woods to look for a survey location, you're looking for suitable habitat where there'll be food for squirrels. And you're looking for two trees that are relatively close to each other, about two and a half to five meters to install the feeder box and the camera. There needs to be a food source for squirrels I look for Scots pine or conifers and large seeded broadleaf trees. See what you can find. Have a look around on the forest floor as well. Sometimes you find cones that have been 
stripped and eaten by the squirrels. Right, I'm going to install our feeder box. It's sometimes a good idea to attach a, a little tag to the camera as well just to identify which uh, group or organization you belong to and what it's all about. Let's uh, put this feeder box on this tree. Got two screws. There's various ways you can attach it to the tree. You can use zip ties. I like to use screws because they do come out and they don't stay in the tree. That's really important for timber production and not leaving metal around in the woods. Anyway, so we're just going to attach it about breast height, shoulder height, not too high. And uh, I'll just get these screws ready to go in. Remember to bring your screwdriver. Right, so it's about there. I've got my electric screwdriver. Of course you can use a manual one as well. But takes a little bit longer and just secure it at the bottom as well I've already got my sticky tab on there to collect hair sample as a backup method just in case the wildlife camera malfunctions um, so you've you've got the velcro loopy part on there stuck on and also stapled on so it won't come off and this is the velcro hook with the hook part sticking to the velcro loop so it's ready for you to peel off the wax paper to expose the sticky surface right so that's fairly secure let's put some seed in there right so I've got my bag of feed here and it's a mixture of sunflower seeds, maize and peanuts and the proportions is 45%, 45 and 10 sunflower, maize and peanuts that's the um, normal squirrel survey mixture that we use and then you just top that up right to the top depending on how long you plan on leaving it out. Some people like to mix in a, a lure uh, and a seed oil, just, just a drop in the mixture. But the squirrels find the smell appealing. Right, so there you go. Feeds in and all we now need to do next is remove the sticky wax paper and that exposes the adhesive surface when the squirrel comes along. Make sure that your feeder box is not too full so that the feed sticks to the adhesive surface. Right there you go, we're all already on this side now we just need to set up the camera on the other side. So we're going to install our camera opposite the feeder box um, we're about two and a half meters away. Anything between two and a half meters and uh, five meters would do. Um, further than that, probably it's a bit far. This tree seems okay. So we'll just attach it to the tree over there. There are so many different types of cameras these days on the market you can pick up a camera quite inexpensively around about 30 pounds obviously the price can be way more than that over 100 pounds make sure you get a good type of battery so the brand I like to use is uh, Panasonic in a loop. They just tend to last really well in the cold where they re retain their charge quite long. So you've got to make sure that your camera is lined up to the feeder. Um, 
you can see I'm just using a little stick at the back there just to prop it up a little bit like so um, and you, if you like you can do a test shot as well there's so many different types of cameras they, they, the settings and on and off switches in various places this one's at the bottom and it's got an on off and a test I've already set this camera up so I can just switch it on and close it and the red light will flash for a few seconds whilst I have a chance to get out the way and it's ready now the settings we tend to use on the cameras normally your medium sensitivity is sufficient uh, instead of a high or low sensitivity and detection when anything moves medium tends to be okay but I would just test and have a play with your camera and see what works best for you now we set the camera to take two still photos per detection and then wait for a 30 second gap before it takes the next set of two photos otherwise it will just keep on taking photos and you'll have thousands to review um, that setting two photos per detection take a 30 second break before the next detection and next set, two sets of photos that tends to work for us so it's all set up and ready to go and we leave the cameras out in the field for about two weeks at a time and um, then we move it to another location uh, your situation can be different it all depends on what your objectives are um, whether you're trying to detect a particular gray squirrel that you've spotted or red squirrel and uh, it'll it'll help you to learn where the incursion routes for gray squirrels are where are your red squirrels one thing I wanted to also say about the cameras is before you head out make sure your batteries are charged don't forget your batteries at home and also remember your SD card the memory card that needs to go inside the camera don't forget it um, take it with you make sure you have a checklist before you head out make sure you've got feed your feeder box your sticky taps screws screwdriver the camera batteries and the SD card hopefully I haven't forgot anything there you go Right, so hopefully you enjoyed that and that was informative. Looking at Pine Martins next, um, I've got a little video on that one as well. Uh, it's just under three minutes and I'll set it off now. About 6,000 years ago, the pine martin was a very common and successful animal in Britain. In the days when we were completely covered in woodland, it was the second commonest carnivore in Britain, after the weasel. Then, by the late 1800s, after we humans had cleared most of our woodlands, the pine martin was an extremely rare animal. Uh, it was probably by then the second rarest carnivore, after the wildcat. And the main reason for that was that we had removed 95% of our woodland cover, which was extremely difficult for a woodland specialist species like the pine martin. And of course people started killing pine martins long before then. Uh, they were killed for their fur, they were hunted for sport, and being carnivores, um, they were the enemies of the game shooting interests that really took off in Britain in the mid-19th century. Today, in Britain. The pine martin has recovered well in Scotland 
but elsewhere in Britain, particularly in England and Wales, it remains an extremely rare animal, very close to extinction, with absolutely no signs of recovery. We're managing this forest for red squirrel conservation as well as commercial timber production. And the way we do that is by managing the habitat, but also more importantly, controlling grey squirrels. And we, we control the grey squirrels with, with these cage traps, uh, which we, uh, we bait and pre-bait for a number of days. And then uh, catch the grey squirrels. And, uh, and it's illegal to release them into the wild, and so we have to kill the grey squirrels. It's very labour intensive and it's quite costly and maybe not that sustainable in the long term. And what would be ideal would be to have another solution. And uh, I know myself from my own experience of working in Ireland and in Scotland that there's anecdotal evidence from Scotland that uh, pine martins have uh, an impact on grey squirrel populations. And there's, re there's growing research evidence from Ireland as well, uh, certainly in County Leash and Offaly. Uh, grey squirrels have completely disappeared in the presence of pine martins and red squirrels have returned uh, to their normal levels and that would be really good news for us because we wouldn't necessarily have to spend so much money and time controlling grey squirrels with traps. So since that video was made, I think it was 2016, um, some further research has been done. Um, he, it's referred to a study in Ireland and um, the, the study conducted and published there showed that there was a, a significant um, change in what was happening in, in the landscape. Um, the grey squirrel population crash, crashed across more than 9,000 square kilometers, which is, which is a massive area. And uh, red squirrels naturally recolonized that area. Um, the exact mechanisms for this wasn't fully understood, still isn't completely fully understood, uh, and, and, and further research is needed. It's believed that pine martens stress gray squirrels because gray squirrels uh, evolved in a different environment in America where they didn't have this type of predator chasing after them and um, it, it could be a stress factor that causes them to not breed as much or leave the area um, and and a, a question might be well do pine martens not predate on red squirrels well they do but this particular study in Ireland um, by Dr Emma Shee uh, showed the they looked at what uh, pine martens diet comprised of and squirrels was very low on the list uh, I think um, grey squirrels was something like 14% and red squirrels was around about 4%, so a very small proportion of their diet. Um, red squirrels did co-evolve with pine martens. Reds also tend to be more canopy dwellers, so they're more up in the trees than down on the forest floor, whereas grey squirrels, are, they like to be on the forest floor more so. They're also bigger and bulkier, they're worth a meal and worth a chase. Uh, it might also be that red squirrels, because they canopy dwellers and lighter and smaller, can get to the end of a branch where uh, perhaps just out of the reach of um, pine martens, whereas grey squirrel a bit heavier and can't get away as quickly and as far to the end of the branch. Uh, this is a study also by Emma Sheehy in Scotland. Very interesting. Um, so th th three different areas they looked at um, borders and, and, and up in the north and essentially well all the areas they looked at had all three species overlapping territory and wherever they found that uh, um, pine martin numbers was high so this is represented by the the line at the bottom the occupancy of gray squirrels would drop. So the higher the density of pine martens, the lower the density and prevalence of gray squirrels. The opposite was true for red squirrels. The higher the, the density occupancy of um, pine martens, and the more red squirrels they were. So that, that's a positive correlation. So um, very similar to the, the Irish study. And in the north of England, um, we do have pine martens that are 
coming from the borders and repopulating killed the forest and the surrounds and you can see in North Cumbria there are a few isolated um, detections as well. This is a, a image from one of our survey cameras to detect uh, red squirrels that um, that pick up a pine martin. We did attach a, a lure there because we suspected there might be a pine martin and so there was. So there have been quite a few sightings in Kilda Forest. Um, before we move on, move on um, in Cumbria, the University of Cumbria are currently conducting a feasibility study for pine martens in Grisdale Forest. Uh, it's called, it's part of a project, a wider reintroduction, not that pine martens are being reintroduced, it's just a feasibility study, but the big project is called Back on Our Map, uh, which is coordinated by the University of Cumbria. They are, they are introducing plant species and so on. Um, but the pine martin is, a, is, is part of this program as a feasibility study. And uh, if you go and search on the net for Project Boom, back on our map, you should be able to find some information on that. Moving on to uh, contraceptive uh, for uh, grey squirrels. <laughs> um, uh, we did see a video clip earlier on during the bark stripping episode where um, Dr. Giovanni uh, explained to us that they're doing. It needs to be very specific, uh, whatever is produced. Um, there needs to be no side effects uh, uh, and, uh, on the welfare of uh, other animals. There must be on the animal itself and it must be effective in the long term. And there must be no non-target spe species affected. For example, if a raptor had to catch race squirrels, uh, it mustn't af affect them. Um, and all these points are being looked at by the Animal and Plant Health Agency, who, who are conducting a five-year research project. Uh, they're now in year three, and um, with the ultimate aim to have a product that's licensed that can be mixed in with a bait. Um, and the bait stations will need to be species specific as well because obviously if you want to deploy it in red squirrel range it needs to exclude reds but allow greys to access the bait um, and it needs to be cost effective and affordable and so as i mentioned it needs to be uh, uh, there needs to be a feeder that's species specific and this is being looked at as part of this research project at the moment how can you help squirrels? Um, the monitoring program, as mentioned, it's, it's really uh, enjoyable exercise to get out in the woods and, and see what's there. Um, you know, over you, it's basically visiting the forest three times, install the feeder and feeder box, revisit two weeks later to move it to the second point, and then the last, right at the end of uh, the four weeks, you return to extract the equipment and review the SD cards. Um, this is an illustration and map showing where all the survey sites are across the north of England. So if you find yourself near to any one of these dots on the map, um, it could be that you be able to help. Grey school management, we're busy developing a, a training course and collaboration with British Red Schools and various other uh, organizations and local groups which should be ready hopefully at the end of summer. It will be Elantra approved and just what we need right now to, to equip uh, volunteers to help with this exercise. Supplementary feeding, uh, there are some information on the web and on our website soon to be updated of what uh, is good to feed squirrels and what is not. Um, they love peanuts, but it can cause calcium deficiency. So it needs to be mixed in with other um, feed for example sunflower hearts and um, they don't really like maize but um, you, you can mix it in to bulk out the feed we do because gray schools do go for maize uh, they love um, hazelnuts um, and so on uh, app apples and uh, carrots as well it can provide a cuttlefish bone or a deer antler which they'll nibble on as a calcium supplement um, provide water when you do that but yeah look into that if you if you're interested in supplementing their feed 
join your local group uh, who are always waiting with open arms and, and desperately in need of help. Um, and this is a good way to really make a difference and, and, and do so with others and with similar um, interests and make a really positive difference in your local uh, area. And you can support the work that we do as a project, Red Schools Northern England, and join our Friends of Red School membership, get newsletters, um, and, and that's 20 pounds a year, which is not much, but it's a tremendous support for, for our project. Thank you very much. So um, hopefully uh, just about on time and hopefully you can hang around for a few questions. I think Helen is, has saved the questions for me, so I'm going to quickly work through those. I've got 11 questions at the moment, and um, if I just start at the top. Yeah, make sure I can see them. Right. What was the name of the camera that I recommended? Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned a particular model, um, but there is one that we tend to use these days uh, called TOGUARD, T-O-GUARD. they about 30 pounds on eBay, and they're really good. I uh, give it a sufficient definition. Um, yeah, I, I praise them, so they're really worth using. Obviously, you can spend more and get something that's a bit more sophisticated, but the, the TOGUARD does the job very well. Um, what tips for encouraging red schools in your gardens? Is there any, uh, um, I want to just take one question at a time. Encouraging reds to your gardens, they love food freely supplied. So if you, if you live in a red school area, yes, they'll, they'll come. Um, they, a few hazelnuts uh, you placed here and there to entice them, to help them find the feed, they might help to them to find it quicker. Um, is there a grape proof feeder? Yes, there you, you can buy them. I think the, the online sh um, shop's called Arc Wildlife, and um, they sell a feeder that's got like a wire mesh around it that excludes gray squirrels. The mesh is of a particular size. I think it's around about 65 millimeters, which allows a red, adult red school through, but adult greys can't get in. Uh, type of food, I think we, we covered that. Uh, when to put the feed, where to put the feeder. Um, I have once seen a red running along the garden fence, so would love to encourage it. Uh, about shoulder height, uh, fixed to a pole or a tree. Remember what I said earlier about not enticing them to cross roads. So please just think about which direction they're going to approach and place the feeder in a sensible position. But yeah, just on a tree in the garden. Um, do disinfect the feeders regularly. What is regularly? Um, how long is a piece of string? But yeah, I'd say uh, it depends how busy your feeders are. Every two weeks, take it down, wash it down, let it dry use a disinfectant, we recommend Vircon S, which can be bought online. Just spray it down, let it dry out and, and put the feed back up. It's also advisable to move the feed feeder um, occasionally because there will be a buildup of debris, leftover seed on the ground that will entice mice to come along. Mice do drop droppings and there can be adenovirus. They, uh, the thriving carrier of adenovirus, which can be lethal to red squirrels. So it's advisable to move the feeder around a little bit every two weeks or to sweep up the spilled seed. Um, my questions are moving around a little bit. So when is the breeding season for red squirrels? Well, it can start very early in the year. Um, let's say March up to about August time, but it can overlap a little bit, depends on the environmental factors, the weather, and food availability the preceding season. Do jackdaws predate on the dray, or I presume that means do they, well, they don't predate on greys or reds, um, but do they use the drays? I've never heard of a jackdaw using a dray. 
I suppose it's possible. <laughs> what can we do to convince the south of England to control the Grace II? Um, I think they're slowly being convinced by Grace schools making significant damage, causing significant damage to the forest industry and trees, as we watched in one of the videos. Um, a lot of the research by Anim Animal and Plant Health Agency now for fertility contr control is driven by a need to address that problem of tree damage down south. So it, it really needs, it, it's on the radar, it's on, on their to-do list. Um, do reds and greys eat the same things? Yes, they do. Um, maize is the big question. Do reds will eat maize, but they don't prefer it. Grey schools will generally go for maize, uh, but there is an overlap with all the other seeds. <clears throat> uh, what was the, oh, okay, we've done that one. Um, we have a grey that comes to our bird table. Can we give it some contraceptive? Not yet, not at the moment. The, the product is still in development, uh, not yet licensed. So it's it's still a while still before that's available. The uh, the the practical research that can currently be done is to um, develop a deployment methodology for when it's ready to develop a feeder that's species specific. Uh, there is a potential drug product um, that the APHA are looking at, but it's going to take some time before it's licensed and ready to use. At least it's it's happening. Um, I understand that the reintroduction of pine martens clears the grey school whilst leaving the red schools to thrive. Are there any plans to use pine martens to cull the grey population? The research in Ireland demonstrated that you that you need pine martens at a particular density, uh, so X number of pine martens per hectare of woodland, to have that. Um, that impact, the, the required impact. Pine martens are slowly repopulating uh, the landscape themselves through breeding. They're very slow breeders, uh, so it will take some time. Pine martens do well in habitats that's old, um, mainly because they require old trees with nesting dens in them, so the cavities in the trees so that they can nest in them. What some organizations like the Vincent Wildlife Trust are doing is trying to facilitate that process by producing, with making den boxes out of timber with volunteers and installing them in various places. Um, so even if you reintroduced pine martens like they did in Wales, it still takes time. It's, it's yeah, years before, like I said, they breed very slowly and it's going to take time, but at least there needs to be a start. Um, boxes going in for now to help facilitate them in, in various places. Um, do red and grey squirrels interbreed? Nope, they don't at all, thankfully. Uh, what is a healthy tree mixture? Um, it's, it's really difficult to answer that. Squirrels like uh, large seeded species. Um, because it provides a bigger meal, like beech trees and hazelnuts. They like that. Um, one thing to be careful of, uh, one thing to be careful of is you don't want to facilitate the, um, the, the movement or the, or the increase of, of gray squirrels. So that just needs to be, you need to bear that in mind. We do have a list of tree species that are favorable that are neutral and that are, are negative um, uh, negative is perhaps the wrong wrong word it's it's more that it, like an oak tree an acorn is a really good meal for a for a, a gray squirrel and um, in some places in the north we've not not only ourselves but also forestry england have and forestry commission have recommended people don't plant too many oak trees in one particular area to facilitate incursion of gray squirrels. But it's not to say you shouldn't plant them, it's just how you plan your planting. Sorry, I hope that answered the question, but we do have a list if you wanted to email me and I could send that over. One of the regular reds we have visiting has a white tail with a very obvious black spot. Is that unusual? Uh, yes, I'd say so. <laughs> um, 
scrolls, you, you'll find red scrolls with various colorations and sometimes you'll find one that's got a blondish tail and another one that's got a red tail, another one's got a slightly darker tail. Um, I think this is just through genetic variation. It is believed that the original genetic stock from um, Britain, especially in Scotland, uh, the original native native reds have more blondish tails that I have read somewhere. Got to realize that in the past reds have been brought over from the mainland as well, um, from France and Poland, and um, so there's a mixture genetically. <clears throat> do red squirrels damage trees in the same way? Um, they do nibble on bark, but they don't cause nearly as much damage. Red squirrels don't live at that high density that gray squirrels tend to live in a woodland. So reds are much more spread out and if, if any damage, it's minimal, but gray squirrels are a significant problem. I think that's the last question coming up now. Is there any evidence that reds are developing any resistance to the pox? N not as far as I'm aware. Uh, there was some research done in the Sefton, um, Lancashire red population and suggestion there were suggestions that there was some immunity in develop, developing naturally but the evidence wasn't conclusive or at least it didn't convince me so i don't think so not yet there is a organization called um, uh, wildlife arc trust who are hoping to develop a vaccine for squirrel box still You've got to bear in mind deploying a vaccine to a population of red squirrels on hundreds tens of thousands of reds is, uh, is a challenge but perhaps it does have a role to play in, in particular areas where there's an outbreak so there is a vaccine in development but it's not ready yet and that could be a few years off uh yes the, that was the last question unless there are any more helen if you see any more um just having a quick look if there were any more questions. I don't think so. Thank you very much to everybody for joining us today and listening. Uh, hopefully that was informative. Do get in touch with your local group if you wish to get involved. Do get in touch with ourselves if you want to be involved with the um, monitoring program or anything else. Uh, there was one quick last question what is the situation in europe um they still in a good position but understanding understandably very worried about the ray squirrels in the process of spreading in northern italy um but yeah most of europe is still okay apart from italy where there is some concern <clears throat> i'm just seeing if any more questions are coming up um Great, thank you very much. Thank you again. And um, do send us an email or keep an eye out for the link which Helen will, the links to websites that Helen should be sharing. I say goodbye. Thank you.